what you wanna believe, then you can leave it up to me, and I'll give you the key. It's easy. Just keep on hopping, keep on rocking, and don't start stopping. Mike and Matt, this is my first podcast with two people coming on. So this should be fun. (laughs) Uh, I'm super excited to have you guys on the show because you are kind of bridging the gap with things because you're kind of bringing DNA into, into the, into the mix of things. Whereas some people it's nutrition, some people it's fitness, some people it's like more functional health space. And you're kind of bridging the gap between all of that. So I'm excited to have you on the show. Uh, I don't know who wants to go first, but you guys want to tell me a little <laughs> bit about your story and what got you going with all this. Sure. Yeah, we um, you're right. We we try to take a really holistic approach. And so to just kind of tell you how we got started, we were in the more kind of traditional medicine environment. We both were working at universities, kind of an academic centers, and um, we saw all the problems with modern medicine and traditional medicine. People just weren't getting better. Uh, it was sick care, not really health care. Um, and while we were practicing in this environment, we, we saw a tremendous amount of science and evidence emerging around personalized medicine and actually looking at DNA and genomics. Because uh, if you go to the doctor now and they say, hey, do this because evidence shows or the studies show this works, what they're really saying is this worked for 60% of people or 70% or even 80%, but not every person. And it's really based on statistics, and epidemiology, and kind of a one size fits all. But the science was there for this kind of precision medicine and personalized. So we, we started just by experimenting on ourselves. We're, we're, uh, we do that. We're into kind of performance optimization. Uh, when we're not working, we're doing kind of ultra marathons and races and things and just trying to improve our performance. And we found some pretty fascinating things when we looked at our own DNA. Um, we saw pretty quickly that we needed basically the exact opposite diets. And we, uh, when we looked and we saw that Mike had a lot of sensitivities to saturated fat and I really didn't, I was a little more kind of carb sensitive in general. And as we started playing around that with that, we would do experiments with ourselves where we would eat the exact same food for 48 hours, do the same workouts and measure kind of performance and ketones and glucose levels. And it was just remarkable. Like we responded very differently. Like me, almost a, almost a, a keto, very animal uh, heavy paleo style diet where Mike more vegan and plant-based um, to really dial in, not just our performance, but even our numbers, like inflammation and lipids and things like that. And, and after seeing that in our DNA and then seeing that in the performance, we, we kind of had some aha moments of like, okay, this is why diets are kind of like religious wars. Everyone thinks their diet is the perfect one because they've tried them all and then they find one that works for them and they think that it should work for every human. And we're not like that. We're very individualized. We've known for years, like pharmacogenomics, like there's specific medications for different people based on DNA. And food is kind of the same thing. It's that food breaks down into molecules similar to medicines. We should let food be our medicine. And so why wouldn't apply to medicine as well? And that, that's how we that's how we kind of got got started down the rabbit hole. I like it. I like it. As Matt was saying, there's sort of this, um, there's sort of this concept in medicine towards evidence-based medicine, um, which has been a great thing for healthcare, right? I mean, I think people deliver better healthcare because of evidence-based medicine, but as he alluded to, every study is designed to try to apply the same principles and the same interventions to every patient, assuming that they're all going to respond the same. And um, when you look at a study, the first table of any study, any published study is always, you know, a demographics table. And it tells you about the two different groups, the control group and the intervention group. And they list all these different things about them, how old they were, you know, what, what race or ethnicity they were, you know, what their BMI was, it's all these things. But what they don't list is what's their genetic makeup. And in reality, that is another piece of the puzzle that we realized really needed to be in, in the conversation when we're delivering healthcare recommendations to people, because we don't all operate the same. We all operate a little bit differently based on this genetics. 
I gotcha. And that, that makes complete sense, honestly, because here we've got so many people where they're like, well, keto worked amazing for me. And then you got other people over there. They're like, no, you can't do keto. Keto will kill you. You got to go plant-based. You've got to do the, be vegan. You got to do all these things and, or eat high carb. I can eat 800 grams of carbs. Why can't you? Oh, I can train you to do that. You just watch, you know, (laughs) it's like this constant battle. And like, even now in the realm of social media and podcasts and stuff, you've got some major finger pointing going on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and um and we saw it affect not just our performance, but I I kind of mentioned our numbers and things. Um as we were going through this and kind of experimenting, um uh Mike got some cholesterol numbers back that even though he was really healthy, doing everything right, they were extremely high. And whereas my lipids and inflammation got went great with keto, his actually skyrocketed. Um, and then he also his doctor put him on a statin medication which he had bad results, kind of uh, muscle breakdown myopathy from that. And as we started looking at the DNA for that as well, we saw that he had specific single nucleotide polymorphisms that made him almost guaranteed to have that muscle breakdown and myopathy. So it was just another thing where we were like, why did his doctor not know this? And then we just remembered like, no one is doing this. Like, no, the science is there, but no one is actually doing this. And we could have avoided quite a bit of harm with Mike's case. And we've just seen that over and over that this kind of guessing like what's probably going to work. Um, sometimes it does. And sometimes it doesn't. And we think we can do better than that. So it's when you guys, like oops, I'm sorry. It's, it's almost like a shortcut. It's like you're, you, you've got this extra piece of knowledge that you can use to, um, to jump start the conversation with the patient so that you don't have to, you know, do these end of one experiments as often you can basically just jump to what is most likely going to work. And that's kind of where I was going with my question is, so at one point you guys were doing this trial and error thing. At what point did you be like, oh, genomics, that's where it's at. We're going to look at all these things and we're going to totally dial ourselves in. I mean, I personally have been doing self-experimentation for quite some time now, and I haven't ever been like, oh yeah, I think I should look at my DNA. (laughs) Well, we just, we just noticed the science was there. There were hundreds, there are thousands of studies on genomics uh, showing what advantages, disadvantages people have and how you could actually apply that. Um, and we started applying it. Normally in medicine, when you get studies come out or like emerging science, it takes at least a decade for it to actually cap- catch up in clinical practice. So we were in that gap period where the science was there and no one was doing it. So we just, once we started applying some of it and saw that it truly worked, then we went all in, like, what are all the different things? I mean, for, for myself, it was more about um, recovery and athletic performance. So at the time I was doing Ironman races and I, so I was doing a lot of volume and I was just constantly inflamed and stiff. I had to like sit down to put my socks on. And when I looked at my genetics, I saw I actually needed more recovery than most people. Um, I also had this collagen snip that made me more likely to get tendon ligament injuries. And I was just chronically had those. And so when I started having a little more recovery, eating more collagen protein, like sardines, bone broth, my recovery by performance just really shot up. Uh, I did so much better. I felt better. And that was just another, we have dozens of examples of, like that, but after you get, after you do five or six of those, you can see this really works. That's when we started. We'd like, we're going to devote ourselves to this. We're leaving the academic world and we're going to go all in and apply this, not just to ourselves, but for everyone else that wants it as well. Yeah. So along that line, this sounds like it could be complicated. You're going to get a whole lot of information from this. Obviously, when you start looking at this, I, I, I mean, I know from coaching, looking at just even labs, sometimes it's like, okay, well, where the heck do I start with this? So how do you guys break this down so that you know how to attack it once you have this information? Well, so for us, go ahead, go ahead, Mike. So that's a really good question because uh, it it was uh, super challenging. Um, as you know, you know, genomic tests on on patients is is huge, right? So you're talking about like seven hundred thousand different SNPs or sing, single nucleotide polymorphisms that you're looking at. And granted, a lot of those probably don't mean anything, but you've got to sift through them and find the ones that mean something. So we basically uh, to start. We had, we would sit down before every meeting with a patient and have just like, you know, piles of papers in front of us where we're sifting through the genomics, we're sifting through their laboratory data, we're sifting through like the questionnaire that they gave us. And we're trying to compile all that information in our head and come up with recommendations that we 
can then deliver to the patient. It was a very manual process and it took hours before every single patient encounter. But very real, very, very quickly, we realized this is not going to scale. Like we can't, we can't get this out to as many people as we want to, if we're just sitting here, like, you know, stuffing all of this information in our brain and trying to make recommendations. So we very quickly had to basically build a software that worked as an, as a algorithm to make recommendations to patients. So, so currently what we use is a software called Clarity that, uh, Wild Health Clarity, that basically you, you input the DNA file, you input laboratory testing and a questionnaire data, and then it spits out a report basically. And you still have to go through that report and come through things, but it speeds up that, um, that physician's time to deliver that content to the patient so much quicker. And it's still extremely important that we talk to the patient because you, know, you can't, no algorithm's perfect, but it gets you that head start that you can um, sort of get some of that information beforehand and start to deliver it to the patient. And it, and it cost us um, millions of dollars and three years of like really intense work to build that. But we knew it was going to be worth it. Our, our first few patients, like my mom was one of our first patients. My, my grandmother had um, Alzheimer's and we were worried about my, my mother and her genetics. And sure enough, when we look at her DNA, she had that risk factor several times more likely to, to get Alzheimer's. And she, um, and so we put her on the program doing the really manual kind of 10 hours of prep work, these hundreds of pages of documents. And in three months, she lost 40 pounds, reversed her insulin resistance and said she felt 20 years younger, but Mike's mom on the program and she lost uh, 50 pounds. And so it's like, when, when we had these results, um, we knew that, uh, although the 10 hours wasn't scalable, like this had to get out to the world. And so we really took the three years and quite the investment to make it now a process that is relatively automated and one that other providers can use. And it takes a short enough time that it actually is affordable for folks as well. That was a problem with it taking so long as physicians time is expensive. Absolutely. And I want to kind of touch on something you said there, you were talking about more preventative measures, if you will, uh, because you, you hear a lot of people of like predisposition to autoimmune or like you said, Alzheimer's or cancer or certain conditions. Now with this testing, are you able to target that and do and approach things from a more preventative manner? Absolutely. I mean, we, um, an important thing to note though, is that DNA is not destiny. So you've heard that saying DNA is destiny. That's not true. Like DNA is about 20% of our health outcome, but epigenetics, everything that we eat, stress levels or exercise we're exposed to turns on and off those good and bad genes. So we need to identify those genes like the ApoE4, like in the case of my mother, or that also is a really big risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So identify these risk factors and then we can do something about them. Like we can actually really focus on the preventative part and prevent it. And whereas maybe five to 10 years ago, a lot of people would say, well, I don't want to know about that, the Alzheimer's gene or, or these other genes. Well, maybe that's the case if you can't do anything about it, but we can actually do things about it. And we think it's really empowering to know that because we can really focus and get ahead of it 20 to 30, 30 years earlier, and not have those horrible diseases and outcomes. Absolutely. I tell that I work with a lot of people that have autoimmune conditions and, and I tell them, I'm like, listen, this is a gene that got turned on. So you're, yeah, your mom might've had it, might've passed it down to you, but at some point it had to be turned on and that could have potentially been prevented. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and just know that knowledge is power. So, so having that information early is just really going to affect health outcomes later before it's too late. Absolutely. And then all health outcomes aside, inflammation is like the devil, right? So if we can just do our best to be preventative with that alone, we're going to feel so much better with all of those other conditions, you know, off to the side, we, we just want to perform our best. That's a great point you make about uh, inflammation too. It brings up another point of how we practice. We, we do look at kind of your DNA, which is your human operating system and your potential, but we also do a lot of blood testing and other biometrics because while we're going to get a really nice hypothesis looking at your DNA as to what's going to work, what's going to be the perfect diet, perfect exercise program for you, we also do a lot of testing to confirm that. So we'll look at your CRP and other inflammatory markers frequently. And when we suggest, hey, this diet is probably going to be best for you, we're going to measure before and after and make sure it actually is and then iterate on that process. So that testing uh, is really an important component as well. I love that you can't manage what you don't measure. I tell people that all the time. <laughs> It's totally true. And, you know, just specifically with inflammation, like you were saying, it's, it, it has, it plays a role in so many different disease processes. So, you know, we're talking cancer, cardiovascular disease, dementia, 
diabetes, all of these things are affected by inflammation. And that's one thing that is, it can be challenging to, to discern from just from somebody's genetics. You really have to do look at how they live their life. And, and that's part of the reason why, you know, we're so focused on, on lifestyle interventions, as opposed to treating people with medications and sort of this more reactive style of medicine. So, you know, we use the genetics plus what your, your current phenotypic type is like based on how you're currently living your life and then come up with, with basically, uh, uh, the ideal scenario for how you could live your life and reduce those risk factors for things like inflammation, dementia, cardiovascular disease. I like that. So as far as this testing goes, what kind of things do you learn from it? I mean, obviously you are learning a whole lot, but are there any specific things that you're zeroing in on and testing when you run all of these tests that you guys are performing? Yeah, we, it's the, it's the largest set of testing um, you've ever had, like for sure. No, we, cause it's, it's all the genomic stuff. It's a really big lab panel. I think 40 something different blood markers. We also can look at microbiome and the algorithms incorporate that as well. So it's, it's a lot of, of testing because like you say, what gets measured gets, gets managed. And so when we look at all that as well, though, what we're trying to do is interpret it to actually give uh, actionable steps. So as Mike was mentioning with medications, we usually stop more medications than we start because usually most of the time we find that medications are treating symptoms and they're not really getting to the underlying cause, but having that, not just the, the blood work, but the DNA gets us, allows us to get to the cause a lot more often. So when we kind of zoom in, the things that we're zooming in on are, okay, first let's talk about diet and food. We're gonna let food be your medicine as much as possible. So what are superfoods for you? What are kryptonite foods for you? So to give you an example of that, how all of these have to come together, we may see in your genetics that you have a VDR SNP, meaning you may need more vitamin D. But we also look at the blood work. What is your vitamin D level? And then we look at lifestyle and other uh, contextual things like, are you in Alaska in the winter or Florida in the summer? So your vitamin D from the sun is gonna, gonna go up or down. And then based on all of that, we can talk about foods or supplements. Um, because if you do need more vitamin D, how much you need is going to depend on those three factors. And then if you like shiitake mushrooms or organ meats, maybe we're going to be able to fix the problem with, with food. Whereas if you don't, then you may need a supplement, but it's really all of that information together is how we're going to zone in on. These are the perfect foods. These are foods to clearly avoid based on your genetics. This is go based on your exercise goals. Um, specificity is, is obviously clearly important. Exercise physiology kind of trumps most of this, but after we know what your goals are and what you're doing, you can help dial that in a little bit too. How much more recovery do you need? Should be, you be a little more strength or endurance focused? And then the supplements and medications, which people spend so much money on supplements that may or may not work. And so which ones do you genetically need and phenotypically need with your blood work and how much of those and when can we reduce or take those up and how do we get you off your medications? And if you are on medications, are they working for you? Um, I, I think a perfect example of kind of the intersection of the medication, food, pharmacogenomics is caffeine. It's, a, it's an example I use a lot. We've known for decades that caffeine is an ergogenic aid. So it improves performance like athletic performance. But when we've actually studied it recently with genomics, what they found is that if you're a fast metabolizer of caffeine, it does improve your athletic performance on both 10 K bike time trialing for basketball athletes, for other athletes. But if you're a slow metabolizer, it hurts your performance. So it's just a perfect example of how the studies forever showed that like 80% of people benefited. So we said it's good for performance. What we didn't realize is that 80% of people are fast metabolizers. So those were the people that we were seeing the benefit in. And now we can actually dial in and say, who's going to be hurt by this? Who's not going to benefit and who's going to benefit from it. I like that you're able to isolate those things a little more. I know my husband, he makes fun of me all the time because I take like so many supplements, right? <laughs> and he's always like, geez, you take so many supplements. It's practically like three meals. And I'm like, oh, it's working. So I'm just going to keep it the way it is. <laughs> so, but you know, that some people I'm sure all feel that way. They're like, this is a crap ton, but really they could streamline that a little through the information that you guys have available from what it sounds like. 
Yeah, there's an interesting uh, new one that came out um, to a gap junction gene that actually affects whether you have benefit from fish oil or not, which is one of the biggest supplements out there. So actually looking at that and determining whether people are going to get benefit from taking fish oil, which you know is probably 30, 40 bucks a month, depending on where you're buying it from, can be really useful information for people. And then also sometimes you can just identify like, hey, you probably don't need to take the supplement if you just alter your diet in this way. You know, a lot of the times we can get it from our diet. We don't need additional supplementation and being able to, you know, sort of iterate on that and recheck those lab values to see if you're getting what you need from your diet rather than taking a supplement can be really beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me a little bit more about this process. What does it look like for somebody that's interested and they want to be like, yeah, sign me up for this. I'm ready to dial things in even further. Yeah. So it's a pretty standard process, even though it's personalized medicine to start is pretty standard because we want to get a, a massive holistic complete view of you so start to start the same way with everyone and then it gets very personalized and individualized so when someone wants to start we measure their dna so if someone were to sign up they get a dna kit shipped to their house it's just a saliva test we also need to measure okay all the things that affect how you perform and feel right now your hormones your vitamins minerals all the regular lab stuff so we order a lab panel that they go to a local lab and get drawn um, if they want to do microbiome testing as well, that's just a test that comes to their house. If they want to do other epigenetic age tests, we love looking at that because we can see how much we can reverse someone's epigenetic age. But you order those tests to start, whichever ones um, you want and need. Uh, and then once we have all of that information, then it's a uh, there's a care team that works with you. So the physician and a health coach as well. So the first meeting after we have all the information, we, it's a long meeting where we go over uh, how to optimize the diet, exercise supplements, all of these things, how to really optimize your life. It's done all telemedicine. So we have licenses in all 50 states to practice medicine. So anyone anywhere can sign up and it's telemedicine. So you don't have to, don't have to travel. Uh, and then we come up with this big plan and then we start executing on it after we identify Okay, what are your top three goals? You want to lose weight, you want to crush this race coming up, prevent Alzheimer's, whatever it is. We start operationalizing that based on all of this information. And that's done with the physician and the health coach. The health coach follows up more often just for motivation, accountability, to translate a lot of what was given. And then we retest. If we identify goals, we want to have objective measures. So you want to lose weight. Well, okay, well, how much and by when? And that's how we're going to measure our success. Or you want to, to bring your lipids down to a certain level. Well, how much and when? And we measure and we continue iterating to not just treat illness, but to really optimize this person and keep them as healthy as long as possible. I like it. So this process is pretty lengthy. Obviously you guys have like certain tests for certain people. It kind of sounds like, like, cause you said microbiomes optional, you kind of alluded to that. Yeah. We, we, we've never met anyone who didn't get significant information and we make changes based on the genomics and the blood work. So we use that as the basis. And then if someone has gut issues, let's get a microbiome test. If someone has hormonal issues, then we'll use other tests. If someone we're worried about food sensitivities, we can, we can do those. If there's chemical or toxin issues or questions, we can do that. So we can do a lot of specialty testing, but we start with the basics of the DNA and the blood work. And that usually gets us 80 to 90% of the information that we really need to start optimizing that person. Gotcha. So one question, and this might sound really silly, but I have a whole huge listenership and I'm sure people are think thinking the same thing. There are all sorts of DNA tests out there, uh, that are, you know, claim to tell you if you're athletic or not, or if you can lose weight or if you can drink white wine or whatever they might be right there. And so what makes you guys different from those? I mean, I, I can kind of understand where you're coming from, but I'm just sure there's people out there going, well, why would I do that when all I have to do is sign up for this one online for 30 bucks and I can get the same thing. The, the biggest challenge with those direct to consumer DNA tests is that you're not establishing care with them um, as a medical provider. So they're really limited in what they can actually tell you. So because we're actually seeing these patients as as patients, we're establish, establishing a doctor patient relationship and we can talk way more in depth about risk. So for example, one of the one of the papers that we use to um, analyze our the DNA of our patients is a study out of Harvard from 2015, I think. 
um, looking at 27 different genes that are associated with cardiovascular disease. And you can actually put patients into quintiles of risk. So, you know, low quintile, low risk, high quintile, high risk um, uh, associated with cardiovascular disease. And a study could not could not give you, or sorry, a, a direct to consumer genetic test could not give you that information. But because we're physicians, we're analyzing this data ourselves, we're using these, this, this research protocol to do it, um, then we can actually deliver that information to our patients. So the depth of information that you get around chronic disease risk, um, longevity, uh, these things that, you know, 23andMe or Ancestry, one of these other companies, they can tell you whether you like cilantro, but they can't really tell you exactly what your cardiovascular disease risk is going to be because they, they don't also, they don't have all the other information. They don't know your lipids. They don't know how you currently live your life. So having all of that information together just allows us to compile it all and give you much more granular detail. Yeah, it, may, it may sound kind of strange for us to say this being a genomics-based uh, precision medicine company, but we believe that DNA by itself is almost worthless. Like to just have someone's DNA and to not know about not just their blood work, but their lifestyle, like not just what they eat, but when they eat, who they eat with, how, what their sleep patterns are, um, what they do for fun. Like all of that is critically important. And DNA is a, is a piece of the puzzle. It's a small piece of the puzzle that personally, I'm not comfortable giving recommendations on pretty much anything just on DNA. It's all polygenic. It's all multifactorial. We need to treat not DNA. We need to treat a person. So we need the whole person's view to be able to adequately treat them. Absolutely. You need the whole puzzle, not just one piece of it. That's what I tell people all the time. <laughs> yep. That's exactly right. The more pieces, the better the picture is going to be and the better the outcome. Totally true. Well, I think, I think in, uh, that's one of the problems with medicine in general um, is that we frequently, someone will say they have migraines. So we just zoom in on the brain and the head or someone has um, abdominal pain. We start thinking about just the gut when it really could be something else. Like people aren't a collection of organ systems uh, to treat just like people are not their DNA. People are a whole person and you just have to have that whole picture to really be able to adequately optimize somebody. Absolutely. So what else could we um, touch on as far as how this goes? Like what else should we get out there that people need to understand about this? I think one of the things that um, we have really tried to focus on is not just the theory and what the science says on an individual level, but actually is this working? So uh, you mentioned the kind of direct to consumer tests and things. Um, we don't have a strong belief in those, but believing in ourselves in the holistic view, that's still a belief until we prove it. So we've been very focused on measuring outcomes. So I could tell you story after story of pro athlete or our family members or other things, but that's not evidence either. That's anecdotes. But we've actually measured our outcomes. So in our last 2,200 patients, we looked at um, the biggest measures of health outcomes like hemoglobin A1C for your metabolic health. And what we found is when we actually put people in these precision approaches, people with diabetes, for example, we lower A1C by about 30%, which is a magnitude of order better than any other group out there. The same thing with cardiovascular risk factors. Um, we are statistically significant, more significantly more improving those than other companies. Inflammation, you mentioned. So in our patients who come to us with elevated CRP with inflammation, on average, we decrease inflammation by about 59%. So we have really tried to focus on actual outcomes to people, not just, it, it makes sense. Like when we tell you, we can treat you based on your DNA, that makes sense and people get it, but we want to make sure it doesn't just make sense, but it actually works in the real world. So we've, we're really proud of the, the outcomes, uh, which is important to have. Uh, if you're going to trust someone with your health, um, you want them to prove it. Gotcha. The other thing I would say is we've really been focusing on patient engagement a lot too. So we think that a big piece of the puzzle is, is not just giving people the right information, but actually engaging with them in the right way so that they, they feel empowered to make the life change that they need to make in order to get the, all the advantages from the program. So, um, an app that follows your biometric data from your wearable devices, regular health coaching interventions, challenges, and patient education modules that we can deliver deliver to our clients are, are all huge pieces of the puzzle that we've really been working on over the last few months to try to deliver that, that engage, engagement piece to people so that they feel like they've got a community surrounding them, supporting them, and giving them all the information they, they need to be successful. I love this. Well, this sounds like it really exciting stuff. How do my listeners come look into your stuff and find you guys and get a little more information about it? Sure. So um, wildhealth.com is where we are. We, we are 
treating patients in all 50 states via telemedicine. So it's really easy for anybody to engage. Um, we also have a training program for providers, whether that's health coaches or physicians. We have a fellowship. When Mike and I started doing this, there was no training program. We had to kind of teach ourselves. And so we saw that as a problem, like providers don't get this training. So we have a full 12 month fellowship that people can go through that that's also on the website. People can find um, we created a discount code for your listeners specifically. So if they put in fit farm 20, you get 20% off all the services as well. And um, I think that's probably the, the if someone's interested, uh, jumping in and actually trying it out is probably the, the best way to see if it's a fit for them. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited to look a little bit more into this stuff. You guys have me. I always get excited about all these things. I could jump on every bandwagon out there, I swear. And I, I'm like, guinea pig me, please. Uh, I, I, I say like every diet, I, every everything I've tried it just out of curiosity. It's always interesting, right? So um, you know, Dutch testing, there's so many awesome things out there now. And I am anticipating it's just going to continue to get better and better. And I'm hoping that the world continues to progress towards the functional medicine space and, and we can start helping this society get healthier. Yeah. Medicine has been slow to go there, but thankfully people like your listeners are pushing us to like, everyone sees that, that functional medicine really treating root cause is the way to go. So it's um, medicine is slowly going there as people are requiring it. So I'm, I'm glad that you're out there spreading the message and, and that uh, your listeners are, are into this type of thing. Well, I'm certainly appreciative that you guys spent your time with me today. This was a great talk and hopefully I'll follow up with you soon and we'll hear more about the things that you've learned along the way. Thanks, Connie. Awesome. Be great. Thanks so much for having us.